Uh, some 846,000 people in Ghana have so far received the first dose of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. In an inoculation drive, government believes should help arrest the spread of the virus in the country. Many of those who took the first jab, though, are anxious to know when they will get the second jab now that it's past the eight weeks wait period. The Ghana Health Service says there are not enough vaccines to enable it to start giving out the second dose and is working on getting some more stock. But how long the wait will the wait be and what are the implications for waiting that long tonight we're getting you answers to those questions and many other questions that have come up about COVID-19 including the efficacy of the test at the airport and what the coronavirus travel advisory issued by the Ghana Health Service also means. Dr. Patrick Abouadji is expected to join us. The Director General of the Ghana Health Service will be joining us. But right now, we've been joined by Dr. Yabediako of the West Africa Center for Cell Biology and Infectious Pathogens. Uh, thank you very much. We're expecting to also be joined by uh, Dr. Jonah Mwesi of KCCR. But I'd want to start with you, Dr. Yabediako. We've been waiting. Uh, many people are waiting waiting and, and wondering what are the implications of not having or waiting that long to get the second uh, dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. What does uh, the science tell us about the, how this impacts immunity? Thank you, Ishmael, uh, Israel. Um, the, the science is on our side up to a point. All right. um, so initially, these vaccines, if you look at the um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, the sort of mRNA vaccines, they are given at about a 21, 28 day interval. Um, so about, you know, three to four weeks. Initially, that was what AstraZeneca was, was going to do. But then um, data came out from trials um, or studies done in the UK that demonstrated that actually if you waited beyond four weeks, so eight to 12 weeks, the protection that you got, the boost that you got from the second vaccine um, was better. Um, and so um, the, the, the decision was made to, to change um, the, 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 the guidance such that people who receive their first dose would get their second dose anywhere from eight to 12 weeks later. So the change that has happened in Ghana, switching our, our plans from vaccinating after eight weeks to now vaccinating after 12 weeks is in line with the data. The problem we have is if we have a further delay. There is no evidence that I'm aware of suggesting anything about beyond 12 weeks. Now, that is because every other country that has used this vaccine has given the second dose within the 12-week window. So there's no real data on what happens beyond 12 weeks. We know that the first shot within that 12-week period reduces the likelihood of transmission by 50% and reduces the likelihood of having severe disease by almost between 60 and 70%. So the first dose is quite protective within that 12 week period, but you do need the second dose to now presumably achieve the maximum level of protection that the vaccine can provide. So if we go beyond 12 weeks, then we will be in uncharted territory um, because there's no data. No one has tried giving the second dose beyond the 12 week window. And so we have to be very careful. You know, it could be okay for another few weeks, um, we really don't know. And of course, if you don't give the second dose within the window, then you stand the risk of undermining the work that you've done up to this point and potentially having less than optimal um, protection in the, in, in, the, in the vaccinated population. Now, Dr. Yabediaku, would you then have advised that we would have used or we should have used the doses that we had initially to vaccinate the number of people we could give two doses instead of wanting to spread it to cover, uh, to give one dose or one jab each to all the people we have so far? Um, well, you know, they say hindsight is always 20, 20. Uh, I think in this case, I agreed with the decision to try to vaccinate as many people as you could with the, with the initial doses. Um, that was what the UK did. That was what many countries did. Um, and at the time, it seemed like a good idea because we had assurances that there were more vaccine doses going to arrive. No one could have predicted what happened in India. Um, really, the situation we find ourselves in now is largely because the outbreak in India, or the, the significant pandemic, the, the devastating effects that have happened in India have completely overturned or have turned upside down the plans that COVAX had to secure vaccines from India. India, understandably now, is no longer exporting they are struggling to meet their domestic demand. And so, you know, it unfortunately, you know, when we talked about it, we said, 
we are vulnerable because we are dependent on external supply and factors beyond our control. Um, I still think that the decision to vaccinate as many people as possible was the right, given the fact that even a single dose has been shown to be relatively effective at preventing transmission. So it was the right play. But now we need to find whatever me me method we can to get doses to now vaccinate people with their second dose so we don't waste that effort. All right. Um, I think we have to move away from looking at COVAX. I think what we're seeing with the, the shipment from the DRC, the fact that the U.S. has 60 million AstraZeneca doses that they're going to release, we have to start engaging people who have stockpiles of these vaccines and yeah. looking to get them in um, to at least take care of the people who've been vaccinated and then potentially shift to a different vaccine if we can't find any more AstraZeneca. All right, uh, and I know that the Ghana Health Service says it's frantically working on that to use all means possible to get the vaccines in. But we've also been joined by Dr. John Amwesi of KCCR. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. John Amwesi. And I'm going to put the same question to you, which is, is should we be worried that it's taking us so long to get the second uh, jab or second dose of the AstraZeneca vaccines? Uh, thank you, Israel, and good evening to, uh, to Yao and to everyone else who's listening. Um, and I, I think uh, we have still some time, let's say about right. four weeks more to buy, to get into, uh, within, to stay within a 12-week window. Um, so I would say, well, four weeks is, a, is quite some time to get things in order. Um, I was elated to learn of, uh, you know, the, the 1.3 million doses that we uh, going to be getting from uh, DRC. the DRC. Uh, I think it's really exciting to learn of this. And uh, it, it's interesting how someone else's inability to make use of what they have turns out to be a blessing uh, to, to the rest of us. And this is just the way the world works. I think it's also testament to um, the, the, the way things work in Ghana. I mean, we, we are not satisfied with the way things are because we know we can do better. But the truth be told, we are significantly ahead of many of our compatriot African countries when it comes to our approach towards um, handling COVID and the vaccination. But we can always do better because we have what it takes. A lot right. of others just do not have what it takes. And I've been to the DRC uh, for work a couple of times, uh, and I know the situation there. It's really, really difficult to get any health work or research done there outside of Kinshasa. All right. All right. Now, some 846,000 people in Ghana have so far received the first dose of AstraZeneca uh, COVID-19 vaccine. An inoculation drive government believes should help arrest the spread of the virus in the country. Many of those who took the first jab, though, are anxious to know when they will get when they will get the second jab and now that it's past the eight weeks wait we started the conversation in the first part of the bulletin we've been speaking with dr john amwesi of kccr and dr yao bediakom of uh, whack paper but now we have the full squad because dr patrick abaji has joined us thank you very much uh, dr patrick abaji so we had some questions for you earlier uh, because you were not there well we carried on the conversation the first question i want to ask you is when are we getting the second doses in? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, apologies for uh, Mr. Hassan. I've actually stepped out of a meeting to join you briefly. Thank you. Yes. Um, we promise that in May we get vaccines. And we stick to that. We know that somewhere next week, possibly, we might get some, some vaccines. And so our program for doing the second dose and Working towards the first dose for as many Ghanaians as possible is ongoing. Um, so those who have uh, the first batch to have started their second dose is the 27th. And like I said, that is the earliest time one can receive your first dose. But the evidence is that if you move towards 12 weeks, your response is better. And that is why we are still working with people to ensure that uh, by by the 12th week, all those who are required, who require to have their second dose, would have had their second dose. All right. So we keep uh, getting these assurances because uh, you say, the Ghana Health Service keeps <laughs> saying that you're working on some arrangements, including uh, some vaccines we're expecting from the DRC. Is there a challenge with getting these vaccines from the DRC? We, we thought it had been uh, all sorted out and we're going to get the vaccines like uh, yesterday. No, it's all sorted out. I mean, it, it's coming in by air, and so 
Uh, you come with the earliest flight available, and I think that is probably the one that is causing the delay. But I'm sure that uh, next week we should have something right. coming. But uh, it has nothing DRC. to do with the DRC deciding that they're not going to let go the vaccines that they have? Uh, they are all this part of the uh, those sharing is COBAS facility. And if you do not have the capability to use it, they are moving around. And so uh, this has happened. And then uh, I think about certain countries who are, benefit, who are going to benefit from it. So it's not that you, you collect vaccine and stock it and not use it. And so we are certain that apart from that, there are other bilateral arrangements that are being worked on to ensure that we get vaccines uh, for all. Do you think enough communication has gone out to the people who are anxious and waiting for the doses? Because they were expecting that they would have been called by now, and they haven't been called. And yet, uh, even though the Ghana Health Service has come out to say that, just hold on, we're getting you the vaccines, do you think that we could help with some communication to these people? All right, uh, it would appear that the connection to Dr. Patrick Abaje is frozen, but we'll try and get him back on the line so we can continue the conversation. But uh, fortunately, I still have on the line Dr. Yabediakun of WACBIP and uh, Dr. John Amwesi of KCCR. Thank you very much uh, both for rejoining the connection. And we're going to try and get back uh, to Dr. Patrick Abaje because there's, there are quite a number of questions we'd want to want to ask him. One of them also happens to be the issue that has, the controversy that has come up in recent times, having to do with the efficacy of the tests conducted at the Kotoka International Airport and whether it's time for a review of the procedure that we have. I want to start with you, Dr. John Amwesi, whilst we try and get uh, Dr. Patrick Avacho back on the line. What do you make of the controversies that have gone so far as far as the efficacy of the test at the Kotoka International Airport is concerned? Well, thanks, Israel. Um, I think the testing at the airport is a very critical part of our fight against the COVID um, for two, two reasons, which I have mentioned in other forums. One being the fact that um, one of the, uh, the factors that uh, really is a big thorn in the flesh of success um, in, in the fight against COVID is the potential for the emergence and spread of new strains. This can happen de novo, and we've seen this in several countries where uh, strains have emerged uh, on their own and they completely match um, strains that have also emerged elsewhere. So as, as the, the transmission dynamics uh, change, new strains can always emerge. But then there's also the new strains that will parachute in, that's how I like to say it, and they come uh, with people who are entering the country. And the quickest way this hap happens is via our airports. And so it makes a lot of sense to make sure that when we're testing and trying to detect um, the virus, the, the airport really is, is a place we concentrate on. So um, when you see a, uh, such a change in the numbers of, of cases, positive cases that are coming from the airport, it can tell you one of two things. One, that uh, there really is an increase in the number of positive people coming in to the country. And then it's actually a very good sign in one breath that you have a system which is actually able to pick up uh, this increase in number. And then, of course, at the back of your mind, you're thinking that, OK, so how many might have slipped through? But that's a different question. And then the other side is um, when you see such a huge spike in the numbers, could there be an issue with the system um, which we're using to do the testing and so to detect positives? Now, that also has another side to it. All this is very multidimensional, which is, if it was an issue to do the system, is it that we have improved it, and so we are catching more, or there are problems with the system, and so we're getting many false positives? These are all questions to ask. Now, beyond all that, beyond all that, is the fundamental question of the sensitivity and specificity of the test, which is very well known. This has been very well publicized. So the risk of false positives or false negatives is inherent everywhere in the world with whatever tests you have. All right. Uh, the gold standard uh, that we have is, is the PCR test, uh, but, but 
hardly anywhere in the world do, you, do they deploy PCR tests at the ports of entry. It is the antigen test. And actually, Ghana is a step ahead because we're not just doing a rapid antigen test, we're doing a point of care diagnostic, which is, which is actually a bit superior. All right. But this is not foolproof. The risk of false positive will always be there. I, I could go and explain a bit further, but I can see you're eager to yeah. go on to another yeah. question. So let me pause here. Yeah, so right. Dr. Moisi, you talk about the fact that uh, you hardly come across an airport where they're deploying the PCR test as a, a test you know, for arriving passengers. But the, what I know happens in some of the countries is that, yes, your samples will be taken, but they will run PCR and uh, keep you quarantined. Qu quarantine you for the period until your test results come in. Isn't that another way of making sure that we continue to we do some further work to limit the importation of the virus? No, no, Israel, this is exactly where I was going to. The, the next step, which I would recommend, is, is this. When someone has a positive antigen test, they are, they are offered the opportunity to do a confirmatory PCR test within 24 to 48 hours. This is what the recommended um, uh, general policy is uh, globally. Now, this obviously would have to be at the cost of the individual. On the other hand, if you don't want to pay for this confirmatory PCR, then you follow uh, the system and then you go into the mandatory um, uh, quarantine uh, also at your cost. So I guess it would make a lot more sense to pay for um, a, a confirmatory PCR. Now, it's, it's really important that the systems and the structures are followed. Um, it's so critical in public health. And, and systems and structures are such that they benefit the population, but will always place some individuals at some disadvantage and almost some will be treated a little unfairly. Now, it is this issue of when people are treated unfairly or are invariably caught in between the lines, how do we treat them in such a way that, yes, they may feel that the system has not treated them fairly, All but right. they know that the best was done. And, and beyond that also, in this antigen test uh, screening, I would also recommend that we do a representative sample of all tests that are conducted on people arriving at the airport, whether positive or negative, right. just like in, in some airports and even at Kotoka, sometimes when you're departing or when you're arriving, uh, they call you and do extra security. You ask them, oh, why did you pull me out of the line? They say, oh, you've just been singled out for random extra security. Okay. We can also have a system like that. So Maybe it's there, and Dr. Baji can comment on that, yeah. where we have a random sample of, of everybody arriving and do a PCR just right. to see what our deviation from the antigen test result is. And okay. these are all internal quality control measures that we, we put in place. And let me just add finally, that with this confirmatory PCR testing I'm talking about, which, which I, I think will be healthy to offer um, to people who have a positive antigen test, it should be a completely separate system uh, removed from uh, the system that is running the antigen test at the airport. They shouldn't even know which samples are coming in which were positive on antigen or not. Uh, so that there's this risk of the risk of contamination bias, as we call it, is markedly reduced. And, All right. and so in this way, you protect the rights and interests of the individual, but ultimately the interests of the population, which is protection from um, new cases coming in and particular new strains is markedly reduced. All right. Before I come to Dr. Patrick Abwaji to respond to that, I want to ask you, Dr. Yabidiaku, do you also uh, subscribe to this idea of probably reviewing the processes uh, at the Kutuka International Airport for arriving passengers? I think you always have to review, you know, this COVID is a dynamic situation. Yeah. Um, and the risk profile changes depending on what's going on. So I think what has been um, what has been revealed by the reports from the airport is that there appears to be a high num a higher number of people traveling to Ghana who happen to be positive. Now that probably reflects higher numbers, higher infection rates around the world in countries that people travel from. So whether it's India or other places. Um, so we certainly have to ask ourselves whether or not at this time um, the you know, we have to, we, we are as protected as we were before. Um, and, and so I think that that is, that is why, you know, we have to evaluate the idea of a quarantine or a uh, sort of an isolation period is one that certainly should always be on the table. Um, the, the testing is always going to have some, some degree of error, whether it's false positive or false negative. Some people are going to slip through the cracks. Um, so I think we can ask ourselves whether 
like the, I, th I like the idea of the random sampling. Um, if we find that a large number of the supposed negatives actually are positive, then we, you know, that that is a sign that there's an issue with the test. I believe that actually does happen. I have heard it said that there is a process, a sort of a quality management process, where a certain number of positives and negatives are routinely taken to Noguchi, for instance, All for right. confirmation. So I think that is happening. It would be great in the spirit of transparency if those results were released. You know, every month, um, Frontiers should just re or Noguchi should just release the quality management um, um, guy, you know, report. Tell us that the airport passed 100% or it was 98% or whatever it was. They should okay. release those results so it gives us confidence in the test. All right. But so, I think ultimately what, they, what I take from the recent upsurge in positive cases is that COVID is not dead. COVID is very much alive. COVID is entering Ghana, no matter what we do about it. All right. And we have to be extra vigilant about it. Let me get to Dr. Patrick Abaji, who's joined us now on phone because the Zoom connection is not working. Dr. Patrick Abaji, the conversation on the table right now is that we probably should be looking at a review of the processes at the Kutika International Airport for arriving passengers. I know that the travel advisory has recently been issued. Can you speak to the travel advisory and also the bit about uh, the possibility of looking at the, the review of the processes and a confirmatory PCR test after the antigen test has been um, conducted on the passengers. Uh, thank you. Let me speak more about the airport test. All right. Um, I, I think this is being run with standards from Noguchi and uh, FDA. And the, the, the sensitivity is nearly as good as the PCR. And to some extent, the antigen is able to pick up a title that PCR may not pick. We routinely cross check with PCR. We didn't start doing the test. We've been doing this since September 1st. And anytime we are done that, the margin of error is almost negligible. Unfortunately, because we have had a surge of 75 people, that is what has become an issue. But periodically, we do that uh, to check, to see the standard. FDA goes there every time. Anybody who turns positive, as part of their protocol, there is a repeat before you are announced that two positive reported that we are really positive. And almost all the time, people who are positive are found positive. So why are they going to do their PCR test? Nobody is talking about going to check their standard. Okay, so I think we need to be that if you have a policy, you don't need too much room for arguments and causes delay. And we know for a fact that those who are positive, we have had people, health workers, health directors who have turned positive who have been detained for that period. And so I believe that. You must also respect the fact that FDA and uh, the people who are managing that are not just uh, just 10 or 4 positive. And not even PCI is living 100%. And so I think we need to look at it and respect the protocol. Our current policy is that on the third day, you have a repeat test. We have been doing that. People who are on the third or fourth day are negative are, are discharged. And so that is what we are actually looking at. And so even the ones that we have done, that people are talking about, they have been verified. And there's really very little difference in the, in the test results that we are getting. We are recording lower numbers now, but you can see that the airlines are not going to where we are having the hot, hot, uh, hot spot at. All right. And secondly, those countries are, about, are probably preventing their people from traveling. Are you, are you saying then that uh, you're not, you don't think that it is time to review the entire process to see whether there has to be some changes somewhere? We have always reviewed our protocols. We've always looked at the system and continue to change them. And that's why now, instead of doing the other tests, so we're doing the random sequencing on the second day or first day to the third day, that also gives an opportunity to do another test to see how people can be discharged who are next. And so, I see Israel, if you look at the, the, you come from UK, you pay for two tests and you come back, they come on the third day, you are negative, they still wait for you to take the and test again because of the nature of the, of the disease you are dealing with. And so, 
I think people must exercise this. And the fact that you are PC and negative when you are living, that it can be possible. If that is so, we're not even bother to do the test on the And so, um, let us uh, explain that. In the, on the question of the travel advisory, uh, importation is extremely important. So all the travel advisory is trying to say that if you really don't have to travel, and especially if you are going to some hospital, and you don't, it's not essential, don't go so that we don't have to have uh, more importations to the country. And that's why it is. And we deliberately don't mention country for these changes periodically. We are asking media and other people that you make an inquiry that I'm going to Sierra Leone, for example. Why did I say to the way to win? Should I say those are the things we put on? Yeah. So, uh, and, and another thing you said in the travel advisory is that if you come into the country, you are, even though you may have a, a negative PCR test, you are encouraged to self-isolate. Why? The encourage is very, even for those who get detained, those who get negative at, uh, at the airport, they are still encouraged to go and do self-isolation. Because yes. I can tell you there are people who turn positive seven, eight days after they have left the airport. All right, so the, the question is, why are we encouraging them and why, are, why rather than make it mandatory? Well, I mean, when you are making policy, you have to look at feasibility and the likelihood of compliance. And so you don't go and tell people, you know, you're not going to do, you, know, you give them advice, if a change of uh, their understanding that maybe it is safer for me to stop as to protect my own lab as my friends and my, my family. So you give them the information as to why it is better to stop as to if you can. All right. Now, finally, I want to ask you, how many uh, vaccines are we giving out uh, so far? Or how many people have we vaccinated so far for COVID-19? We have done nearly 900,000. All now right. We have, our data has synchronized about 846,000 so far. But there's still data synchronization, especially in some of the fires. And mind you, some of the vaccines was mentioned to present them two weeks ago. And so... But we have had about nearly 900,000 people have been so far been vaccinated. And are we seeing uh, it reflects in the number of cases we're having? I think in some countries, we, it, well, evidence shows, or the science shows that after the first dose, you see a decline in the number of cases. The decline in the number of cases we are experiencing now in Ghana, would you say it has to do with the vaccine, the first doses we have uh, given? Uh, uh, um, I think it may, it, it definitely is contributing. All but right. there are other factors. All right. We've just come out of the wave, and um, we still, people are still using some protocol has been adhered to, and that's also contributing to the number. But one cannot say all that, especially when you look at the fact that the number of proportion of people who are getting vaccinated is probably less than 5% of the target, and it's only one dose. And so, there is some contribution, but there's a need for people to really look at the, the protocol to say why we have give the out the opportunity to continue to vaccinate more people, people get at least one and people get just uh, fully vaccinated. So okay. we need to look at it too. So we should not rely because some nine hundred thousand are have vaccination. That is not significant to show. But the one approach we did that helped was the fact that we focused on our hospital. And the property trade is most of our cases are coming from. So if you are able to control that area, you have a speed over effect in the rest of the country. All right. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patrick Abadji. Dr. Patrick Abadji is the Director General of the Ghana Health Service. But I still have on the line Dr. John Amwesi of KCCR and Dr. Yabediako of WACBIP. So we've heard uh, Dr. Patrick Abadji. He believes, well, he says that they constantly review their processes. And as far as they're concerned, uh, what they have now is working. Do you agree or have any thoughts on that? I'll start with Dr. Yabe I mean, I think, I think you have to admit that the airport testing is, seems to be working reasonably well. I, like I said, we can't know how well it is working without seeing the, you know, the reports from the quality assurance. And I think, you know, I think it would help in this situation if that was released. I really don't, I don't think there's anything untoward going on, but in the spirit of transparency and putting things out there, it helps to have that because you know, then people can advise, you know, people who are not perhaps directly within 
um, the circle that are making decisions can at least make suggestions. They may have some expertise that may be able to offer suggestions. Oh. So I think that would be useful to know. Um, but I think we do have to, you know, I think his point about people staying vigilant and not, you know, we've, we've not vaccinated enough people to see a, a, a site, you know, to really expect to see much of a market change. What right now we are fortunate, it appears as though things are, you know, it's not gone away, but it sort of seems to have plateaued a bit. But we should look at India as a clear example of a place where everything seemed fine and then it exploded. Um, so we are, you know, we don't exactly know where we are. We have to remain vigilant. We have to hope we can get more vaccines into the country quickly. Um, the target of 20 million by December looks less and less likely. Yeah. Um, but I hope somehow that we can pick up the pace again and, and get close to that number by December. All right. Because so the longer we wait, new variants emerge and this gets much more. All right, Dr. John Mwesi, the point you were making earlier has to do with the confirmatory test. The, Dr. Patrick Abadji says that there's some quality assurance that's taking place. Um, are you convinced uh, we're, we're, we're getting it right with that? Right. Um, and I'd be surprised if there wasn't any quality assurance uh, taking place. So it's, it's, it's heartening to know that it's happening. And just like Yao said, it will be just great to have this made public. I don't right. think there's anything secret about it. It's just numbers, um, and it makes it a lot easier to deal with 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 uh, with, with things and and suggest uh, how, how things should be done. Um, but but there's also another part to it, which I, I think we really need to take note of, which is um, just this this jump that we've seen in the numbers of positives. It's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. One is it shows that something is working because if you can pick it up, it means you're catching them. But there's also the other edge, which is for whatever system you have, there'll always be some cracks or some holes. So it's like a net and a sieve. No matter how fine it is, there will be something going through. So assuming you had a system that was, you know, detecting 45 a day, and maybe two are slipping through. Uh, the system may be so good, so you can detect the 75. The question is how many might be slipping through? All so right. this is the double edge of it. And then the other dimension to it, which I mentioned, and I need to just reemphasize, is just are there any changes in the way things are being done, which is making us detect more uh, really, or a change in the system, which is actually making us uh, derive many more false positives. These are all questions which I think should be asked in the open like we're doing and the answers and the information should be provided openly. It provides a lot of confidence to the general public, also allows those of us who have some expertise to also advise the general public and say, look, we've also independently looked at this and that and we can say everything is just fine. So there's many dimensions and many sides to this and I'm really happy to have this discussion and hopefully uh, we continue to get it right. All right. Thank you very much uh, to you, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Yabidako of WACBIP and Dr. John Mwesi of KCCR. And also thank you to you, Dr. Patrick Abaji of uh, uh, Ghana Health Service, who joined us uh, a, a lot earlier.